What? Wait, so you're saying oh, that Nephi, when he was writing the plates, and he was writing the Lamanites, he wasn't just saying the people that follow my brother. He was literally saying the filthy <laughs> non-believers. Yeah, that yeah. was all. Yeah. That, <laughs> it functions the same exact way as the Maya system. Wow. And what you find is it actually matches exactly in the Book of Mormon. The following is an episode of Ward Radio and does not represent the thoughts or the opinions of KHTS, its owners, or any of its affiliates, nor does it represent the official opinion of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. With that said, sit back, relax, and enjoy the program. Energy. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to Ward Radio. I'm your host, Cardinalis. Today, I'm joined in the studio by Ed Thomas and Jerry Grover Jr., certified geologist and civil engineer is the title, I believe. Uh, yeah. I okay. Think, I've been called, I was a politician, too. Oh, okay. That's that's the best of all the titles, you know? <laughs> anyway, um, he made some waves on this program and uh, was the subject of one of our more popular episodes recently as we dove into his translation of the infamous characters document, okay? A document from early church history that showed what reformed Egyptian looked like that was cop copied down from early translations, presumably, of the plates and so on and so forth. And it has been somewhat of a mystery for all almost 200 years until Jerry Grover, who also happens to be an expert linguist, just translated it. He's given us a little mini Rosetta Stone into the world of Reformed Egyptian and the Golden Plates of the Book of Mormon. And now he's going to just elaborate. He's going to dive right in. We have the original gangster of the translation of the characters document here in studio. Jerry Grover, go. Okay. Well, I get asked this a lot. Um, you know, did I use a stone in the hat? <laughs> and I do have the hat that I used oh, for, the, yeah. for the Reformed Egyptian. <laughs> you know, and then I, I would just wear it like this because I couldn't really look and write at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I translated it. So. Hey, you should put that hat on during the show. We'll be match these, bro. Uh, my you, kid, no, because my kids might actually watch the show. <laughs> no, can you put it on sideways? It would make you look cooler, man. It would just make you look cool. You can take off the headphones and everything. You don't need those headphones, bro. <laughs> you think? You I, can put them on afterwards. You I mean, I'll never look, get a date after this. Yeah. What, what do you mean like you'll that? never get a date? You literally look like one of those rappers from the 90s that you kept do. making albums into the early 2000s. I say you keep it, bro. Yeah, well, I, I most, of, most of the women, LDS women aren't looking for rappers. So. I <laughs> okay, all right. I would beg to differ, my friend. Maybe I would are. beg Maybe to differ. Are. But anyway, show us what's going on with the translation of the characters document, my man. Okay. I'm not a rapper, but when I was 11, I did sing with the Carpenters. So. Oh. Oh. Wow, well, anyway. cool. 1970s street cred. You go, yeah, brother. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I was on the dating game show in Taiwan, too. So anyway. Taiwan. <laughs> this keeps getting better. Yeah. <laughs> okay, keep, keep going, man. So the character's document, people called it the Anton transcript. It's really not. It doesn't have the description of the Anton transcript, which was the transcript that Martin Harris um, brought to Charles Anton for verification of the characters. Because uh, that was described as having an emblem on it and stuff. So uh, it's pretty clear it was not this document. Mm -hmm. This document comes through the penmanship. A handwriting analysis shows it's uh, John Whitmer, and it came from David Whitmer, who gave it mm -hmm. to the RLDS Church at the time. So we have a pretty good provenance on it. Real quick, was the Anthon document the stuff this, – was that Stubbs' work? Uh, the Anthon – no, we don't. No. Really ha we don't have it. Oh, right? okay. That's what we're saying. Okay. Is what, everyone thought this was it? Okay. All these years of church history, but actually looking at it and the description Anthon gave of it doesn't match. Yeah, okay. All right. Good. And plus, we know it's John Whitmer's handwriting. Uh, Martin Harris, he wasn't around, so he may have, this may be a copy of something, but it's clearly not this piece of paper. Clearly, is not the okay. Anthon transcript. The handwriting okay. is too good. late. So uh, essentially. Uh, again, you have Reformed Egyptian, right? That's what um, that was indicated by the Mormon Moroni utilized when they wrote their abridgment. And so the question is, there really hadn't been a lot of research on it, to be honest with you, that I found. There was an Egyptologist back in the 40s and 50s that found number sets in here and Raniel uh, Yearglyph, um, uh, William Hayes, and he just looked mm -hmm. at it very preliminarily. So there was some indication that there actually was Egyptian hieratic okay. or demotic, right? So Okay, rock on. And um, so I looked at I, I was not even planning on looking at it. I was just doing my 
this research on the metallurgy and kind of the question is, okay, can the Book of Mormon fit on all these plates, right? So I said, oh, I'll look at the characters document. At least I can kind of get character density, maybe just a guess. And I was looking at it, I noticed, well, there's a, like on the fourth line down, third glyph over, there's a bar dot nine. Okay. It's that little bar with the four dots. I go, that's a Mesoamerican nine, hmm. right? And it's part of a number set because it's got um, two glyphs away. It's got a four and a 10 and a five and straight, pretty straightforward um, hieratic Egyptian. Um, I One reason I knew this stuff, because I was kind of just, as you know, I'm not only a Dungeons and Dragons nerd at the time, I've also just been fascinated with ancient number systems and how they worked and numeric notation and how people came up with these systems. And so, so I actually knew what Egyptian numbers looked like, right? And so I, I, did, I never really translated Egyptian, but I was familiar with the way they came up with things. Right. And so... And and hieratic and just kind of as a base, you have the monumental Egyptian, which is like the pictures on the temples. Yeah, the cool stuff you see in Indiana yeah. Jones. Yeah. And then there's a shorthand version of each of those glyphs, and that's hieratic, and that existed about the same same time period as the monumental Egyptian. And then there's what's called demotic, which is started in 650 BC. So it was there when Lehi left. It was another kind of additional shorthand. Uh, from the lower kingdom, it has some glyphs are kind of the same as hieratic, but it is a little. It's a different shorthand version. So okay, rock on. So, yeah, and so what I found is it's mostly hieratic, but there is some demotic in the characters document. So it's a bit of a mix. Um, hmm. One thing I figured out, you know, as I went through, I figured out the number system and that all the dates because there are date sets. Um, if you look at that picture there, I've got these little squares around it, right? Okay. Um, there were also these other glyphs that are surrounding or adjacent to the number systems. There's green and purple. Yeah. Um, and those, I, I, as I looked at them, they are adjacent to the numbers. What I found interesting is like, I know I've seen these before. Where have I seen these before? They're not Egyptian. But then I realized they, as I, as I started looking, these are, they are infixes in the Maya it came to pass glyphs. So the Maya had, um, the way they did their chronology, they'd have a, a glyph for a distance number. They they would pick a date and then they count forward and backwards. Whoa. So they say the king was born on this date, right. go back where his birth was this, and they tell you to count backwards a certain number of years or go forward, then he died. That'd be, that'd be like a very simple, but mm -hmm. it's a little more complex than that. But each of the, and, and so that if you go, you do a distance number to set your base date, and then you have an anterior date indicator or a posterior date indicator telling you which direction right. to count. Well, in each of those, there is an infix. that The character's document glyph is an infix or is the actual glyph. So, and, and it, it functions the same exact way as the Maya system in, in that way. So, what I'm telling you is there is, there's pretty... That's one reason you asked in the previous episode why I have Mesoamerica. I mean, I think this is pretty Mesoamerica. It's, right. it's too, honestly, there's just no other explanation. So it's they, a humongous they, coincidence. Yeah, they've borrowed it in yeah. from, from the Nephites, right? Yeah. And then if I look at the meaning of those glyphs in Egyptian, they mean it happened, it, it matches, it came to pass, actually. Yeah. So it's matching the exact, and even the phonetically, you can see like the, so the syllable in the Maya is the same as in the is in the Hebrew or Egyptian. So, oh wow, yeah. So there's okay. more than there's even phonetic mm -hmm. links. So it was it was borrowed in sometime into the Maya system, probably from the Nephites who were adjacent adjacent culture or intermixed a little bit, right? Cool. So, so that's so I as I did the translation, the way what you have to do is you have to actually figure out. You know, I had to go through all the hieratic glyphs, see which ones matched, right? And then determine what words those hieratic could represent. Now, some of them were combined glyphs, where they've taken two glyphs and put them into one. So there were some tricky ones. But essentially, I came up, and if you want to go to the slide 37, okay, the first four lines translated out, because um, the first four lines are not the same as the last three. And yeah, that that's the translation of the first four lines. Oh, really? Yeah. 
So this is literally what the character's document is just saying yep. in the 19th year. Oh, whoa. Of the what the? Whoa. Okay, hold on. I'm going to make this smaller so that everybody else can see it. So this is not the Joseph Smith translation. No, this, this is... is no. This is the Jerry and, Grover translation. Yeah, and I didn't, I didn't. Very like, cool. And I didn't put it in bib. I didn't put it in Book of Mormon language. Like there are a bunch of it came to pass. Right. I could have thrown o- in there. Old I just, English, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just put since and whatever. Right, right, right. Okay, I, so I, it says in the nineteenth year of the reign. Uh, no, in the nineteenth reignal year of Mosiah the first, the Nephites traveled over the mountains to the foreign speaking people of Mulek. These twenty thousand children of Mosiah traveled downriver on the east side of the river Sidon, Gravalha, for eighty days and reached there. I, I added I added Gravalha. No, no, yeah, because that, that actually makes the most right. sense. So. And then it came to pass that after ten years, thus began the period of the seven tribes. After the space of twenty one more years had passed, Zenith with sixty of his people departed, fifty three. So this this doesn't this isn't a passage from the book of mormon i that doesn't sound like a specific verse or anything well what i think so, it what it what it sounds like again i didn't that was one of the things it had too many numbers in it okay. to, to really like okay this doesn't equate to any section of the book of mormon yeah and honestly this one martin harris trans it's it's 116 pages time period mm-hmm. so you wouldn't i wouldn't expect to be able to match it with any if people that say that matches they probably are, are it's not correct yeah uh this looks to be uh, and again, my translation, I'm not saying it's – maybe it's been abbreviated. Who knows how it came through the divine translator. But this looks to me – I project it. It looks like the preface to the book of Mosiah that we're missing. Right. Okay, this first part. Oh, interesting. Right. Okay. And, and so – and it has like the seven tribes. Like some of the stuff, I'm like, I don't know what that is. The period of the seven tribes, we don't have it. Right? That was pre So was this whole pages. thing so, – this whole thing right here – just came from that small characters document right there. The first four lines. Oh, the first four lines. Yeah. So the next, where's the rest come from? No, that's the first four lines. That is the first four lines. Oh my gosh. Yeah, and that's one re- one because one thing is reformed Egyptian really was condensed. Well, man. And, and, and if if you have it came to pass, that's one glyph. So. Oh. I, I'm just saying that that's why people say, oh, the Book of Mormon couldn't fit. It's like, well, you know, you have it came to pass. It's just a glyph. So a lot of these words are just, you know, it's shorter. It's abbreviated. And the other thing I, which helped me during the translation, because I would look and invariably he was using the glyph form, the word, because Egyptian may have, uh, you know, a word may have six different right. words that mean this, that. He was always selecting the one that was represented by one glyph. So he's and and the demotic is only used when that is shorter than the hieratic, so it's pretty clear. And, and he's also combining some of the glyphs, so it's it's pretty clear to me that this is just what he said. It's constructed, uh, it's constructed to be much more abbreviated, so you can say more with a particular glyph, right? Yeah, and they're so, basically choosing whatever is the most efficient of the three languages that seem to be a heritage in their culture in order to take up the least amount of space on the golden plates as possible. Right. That's one of the parameters. So um, and, you know, a, a basically logographic type script is way more compact than right. than alphabetic or, or syllabic, which are the other two. Kinds. This is incredible. Look, it says previous to the ri- arrival of the Lim Heights, Benjamin was made king in the second month of the 436th year after Lehi left Jerusalem. At the age of 83, King Benjamin ascended to eternity, which was 479 years after Lehi left Jerusalem. That's that whole before and after dating that you were talking yeah, about. Yeah, and it's like like after Lehi left Jerusalem, that's one glyph. It's actually a calendar glyph that's indicating that calendar. So yeah, that glyph ends up in seven different, in seven English words for me to write it, right? But they've just represented, so, so it's a count, they're telling you they're on that Lehigh departure It's very calendar. interesting you say this because like one of our co-hosts, Quaku L, who's on a lot of our podcasts and our um, radio shows with us, uh, talks about how, he's actually got a very lengthy name that's a Ghanaian name. And he says, well, that's because in Ghana, like when you meet somebody and you say like, oh, I'm Kwaku L, da, 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 da. And he's got, you know, three other names. It, you literally say like basically what tribe you're from, what day you were born, what city you were born in, you know, and it's all just incorporated into your name because your name is simultaneously a presentation and a greeting. Right. So instead of saying like, oh, hi, my name's Carden. Where are you from? I'm from Los Angeles. Oh, that's great. Which part? You know what I'm saying? Instead of doing that whole back and forth, you literally just would say, oh, my name is Carden, born in the 15th precinct on a Wednesday to the son of so and so. And it's like, oh wow. Okay, great. I got my passport, my driver's license, and my name tag all just in one thing together. 
So it seems like you're saying that's a little bit of what was done here in the character's document. Yeah. And the other thing I'm telling you is obviously this is there's not a word for people talking about word for word. Joseph Smith looked word well. You have this chronological structure that requires you to actually put into English to rearrange everything. Mm-hmm. So, so people that the, the translation obviously had to be different than what the glyph form, you know, order of the glyphs and that kind of thing, in order to have it make sense. Right, and in Spanish and English, we reverse the nouns and the verbs. Yeah, uh, yeah, that kind of stuff. Okay, so, cool. So that kind of gives you the and the interesting thing: all the dates that were in there. Again, the number system is complex. I actually identify most all the numbers they had. And what you find is it actually matches exactly in the Book of Mormon. So the Egyptian hieratic numerals. Well, what I'm saying is, you, there's dates here that we don't have previously, like yeah. the departure of most. But if you go through that, they fit in in the departure of the limb heights, and everything fits exactly within the already known chronological structure of the Book of Mormon. Just say, see what I'm saying? So, yeah. So that's why one reason I'm telling you that I think the translation is correct, just because the complexity of the number system could never. It probability right. is impossible. For me to add up all these numbers and have them equal all the dates and have them be yeah. in the right order and exactly fitting. So the second, go to 38. That's okay. 38 is the, the last four lines translated. And this looks to be a summary. I call it the summary of the prophetic calendar. I think this was probably part of the preface of the Book of Mormon itself. Every other book in the Book of Mormon has a preface, except for like Omni, you know, the ones. So it stands to reason the Book of Mormon itself had one mm-hmm. right and which would have been 116 so, so 60 and <clears throat> one half months prior to the coming of christ samuel the lamanite came to the nephites and the lamanites the nephite primary count calendar was shifted from the 1000 year calendar to the coming of christ calendar <laughs> effective retroactively nine years after the coming of christ calendar started okay now let's stop there. i mean that's that's very long but that's like seven glyphs it's because well, it's it just because it has the calendar. It tells it's a thousand year calendar. It's ninth year meaning, and so for me to write it out to explain yeah. it. So what's this shift? We did a, a a previous podcast about the difference between the Nephite lunar and the solar calendar compensating for some of uh, those shortened prophecy timelines. But you did mention that the Book of Mormon says they changed their reckoning of time. Is this the preface to that change in the reckoning of it, time? It, inclu- it includes it, right? And I think that's one reason is probably the Book of Mormon had a summary of the calendar. So we, mm-hmm. it's, it's kind of confusing, right? And so would have made sense maybe he has that And that would front. be in the lost 116 pages. Yeah, somewhere in there. So okay. Probably wow. at the front, Probably the front Book of Mormon, you know. Like a legend. Yeah. Yeah. The 600 year Lehigh departure calendar period ended in this 92nd year of the reign of the judges. The first and most high king, Christ's son, came to the land of Jerusalem after he was born, uh, occurred two days of brightness and signs and wonders. So there it says it was two days of brightness. Days of brightness, but there's a night of brightness, right? So, so oh, it's, okay. It's that one continuous. Sense. You're right. The Gadian tribe arose, Nephi departed, siege of the Gadian and robbers. Wow, this is incredible. After remaining 50 weeks in the 12th month of the 24th year of the coming to Christ's calendar, Christ ascends upward of the heavens, reign of the judges period ends, thus commences a period of truth and prosperity. Nephi seek after riches, the rise of the fourth generation is complete, and we literally have like the fourth turning, you know, and Nephi's, wow, this is incredible. This is all wow, all just from the characters document. Yeah, and one thing is, as we get as we get to the next section, you'll see the way I did the trans. So this this is not me like just making up mm-hmm. stuff, right? I, yeah, I just don't do that anyway. I mean, I'm, yeah, I guess it's not my nature. <laughs> yeah, so I'm very tedious and mm-hmm. and probably too, you know, get too specific mm-hmm. and and want to be accurate, but. So, yeah, and so that's – and it's probably only part, meaning it looks like there was some other portion before. This is only from Samuel the Lamanite on, and so there was probably other prophecy that we don't have. But it's – the one, one thing that is interesting from this second part that was actually important in this last book I wrote is it actually gives the um, – when the destruction happened, it gives it in the reign of the judge's calendar. So it tells you that these are running concurrently, meaning, as, as you recall – they started the calendar again when Christ was yeah. born, the solar yeah. calendar. It's, this is giving a date, the 125th year of the reign of judges. So it's actually running the judges. Old. And then it actually has them it ending. There's a period ending glyph showing that that's when it ended, the reign of the judges, right? Oh, okay. So, so what I'm saying is you actually have two I, – I, it actually helps calculate because you can actually then tie the two calendars together because we know when, when the destruction was right. in the 
solar calendar now i know what it is in the lunar calendar so anyway, again just another dungeon and dragons uh, another yeah. small detail just, wow. another yeah. book of mormon egghead thing okay and then so about. what's this you figured out what the glyphs for layman and lemuel were well, or the Nephites and the Lamanites? Well, Lemuel's not in there. I've kind of got a different proposal for Lemuel. Lem he's not in the characters document, but interesting is is one of the stops that is projected from Exodus is that an, uh, one guy's come up with. If you consider this volcano in in Arabia to be Sinai, is he has it stopping at the same Valley of Lemuel that most people have figured out now in Arabia. You know, right. as the as the um, where they stopped, you know, for the river. Okay, and, okay. And that, and that in the in the Bible, it calls it Massa. Uh, that's the stop in the Bible. Well, Lemuel is a name in the Bible, and it's projected he's the king of Massa. <laughs> um, oh, interesting. And Massa, a pun of it in Hebrew, is contention. So Whoa. Lemuel's really the king of contention. <laughs> And and they're and they're kind of named by their behavior, yeah, or what they're thinking. Okay, so is. what's layman mean? If, okay, if Lemuel means contention, what does layman mean? Okay, and, then, and and this is just an example. I don't obviously it take forever to go through every glyph here, right? Okay. So um, layman, I, I, so I show you the character's glyph that it's talking about. I show you the monumental which uh, glyph they which has a V or something in front of it. Mm -hmm. If you and, and then and then I show you the um, um, hieratic associated with it. So, um, so these the, there's two glyph forms for layman, and these would be before Lamanite. So it's actually part of the. There's a different glyph for it, but anyway, it's taking layman out because layman's not named himself, just Lamanite, mm -hmm. right? Because there's an actual glyph for it. It means tribe or file, mm -hmm. actually, p h y l e. So, okay. So. So what you do with these names, the name translation was, okay, i got to figure out what's the meaning of the name. So, Because these are not phonetic. They're writing it in Egyptian. They're not trying to recreate Hebrew with Egyptian phonetic. That'd be mm -hmm. stupid, number one. It'd take you more space than the, right. than, the, than the Hebrew would. So you've got um, Layman, uh, another Matthew Brown. And I use the Book of Mormon Monomasticon or other people principally for the meanings because they've done a lot of research. And it basically means no faith or unbeliever. Uh, in the Bible, lo a, a moon. I don't pronounce Hebrew very well. That's found in Deuteronomy. And he's got a whole article on that. So so layman really means unbeliever. That's why everybody that wasn't a believer is just a Lamanite. So it's just this generic term that they use. So you think Lamanite was just a generic term for the unbelievers? Yeah, anybody that wasn't them. And they kind of said that in Jacob, you know, where he says, I'm not going to name all the tribes. It's just Lamanite's anybody that was not for the Nephites. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I so know. we kind of have that concept already yeah. known if to if, us. Yeah, if you're not with me, you're against me, and I kind of dislike you. Right, exactly. Yeah. And then, so, okay, so I've got, now I've got a good meaning. I look in the Egyptian, and actually, there it is, no faith. It means, you know, you have this word, um, MH, and then uh, uh, the unbeliever portion of it. Uh, so you have the V22, which is this little whip hook and then yeah and then you see next to it actually the hieratic is almost the same it gives a similar you know whip form one thing in egyptian they do flip and maya does it too sometimes you reverse glyphs or flip them or do different things with them you, you know what i'm saying so you yeah and it's because it's a it, it's a directional because the meaning is kind of directional is that correct uh, well, the if the if it's facing a certain way, then you read it that way because Egyptian you can read from okay. one way or the other, and so if the, the bird is facing this way, you know that's okay. the way to read. But they also did like these weird things just to give parallel uh, structure, you know, or make it be creative. Maya did a lot of that. They fiddled with their glyphs, or like upside down, all over the place, because they were very creative mm -hmm. with their with their hieroglyphs. So, so you'd expect that um, in the characters document. So. So you actually have, you know, not believer here in in the Egyptian, which matches the cliff, the character's cliff. So Wow. You know, and here this is the hook portion for layman, uh, this D forty two. And now an interesting thing, um, I also kind of show that there is actually maybe some phonetic connection to a portion of the glyph layman here, not totally um, with the Egyptian word RMN, it means carrier or bearer. So I also look and say, well, 
looking from the Book of Mormon, there, there is another word that this Egyptian hieroglyph can mean, you know, with these forms. Okay, yeah. Uh. And it's a different, you know, monumental number, different hieratic. So you have the D42 um, uh, and the... What's a D42? It's, it's the number they give to the monumental. Oh, okay. Oh, so, okay, cool. So when I, and that's kind of what I was trying to show you is when it has a D number in front of it, that means it's this. I'm trying to show you the monumental, and then you go to the hieratic. Okay, Because okay, cool, there's no yeah. real dictionary that shows you this. So I, I, to be thorough so people can look it up themselves, I provide you all of the uh, information. So Okay. Um, uh, let's see. So that kind of goes to the carrier. Then HS also means filthy. Um, that word in Egyptian means filthy, and it is uh, consists of two hieroglyphs, the V28 and the S29, which I show you. Again, it has this hook form and a line form. Okay, so I, I just, this, I'm this sorry, one. I'm trying to wrap my brain around all of this techie talk that you're saying. <laughs> yeah. But so I said it's good. Yeah, so you're saying right here that this little Nike swoosh with an underline underneath it. And that little Nike swoosh with an underline yeah, underneath it. Those are the same words, yeah. That's the same word, and that means it, layman, which you say you've looked up and discovered the ancient origins of that word meaning unbeliever. Yeah, in Egyptian, you find the, the hook and the line underneath it. You construct the, the hieroglyph because you place them, you know, however they go. It actually does mean that in Egyptian. There are a couple other so layman, Egyptian words that it, it actually matches as well, meaning there's actually multiple meanings in these in these names in the glyph forms I, I my proposal in the book of mormon is you actually have some names that have meanings in hebrew mm -hmm. phonetically you actually have an underlying egyptian meaning that matches that gives some other just uh, some other feature of the person and then you may have this constructed sumerian also that i talked about as possibly being the origin of jaredite names so the the names are very complex and have multiple meanings wrapped into the glyph form okay does that make sense what i'm saying yeah, yeah. well you're saying it's got a doubly entendre and you're saying yeah. also that okay so layman you've pretty much settled on means contentious sorry uh lemuel means contentious you think layman means non-believer and there's a glyph for the ites which would be meaning the tribe of the unbelievers yeah I mean, okay we're just looking at, that, at this bar hook so the bar hook yeah. is layman mm -hmm. and what i'm telling you is so the word layman in the Hebrew, Bowen shows that that means unbeliever, right? And it's basically biblical. In the Bible, it shows that. Then, if in the Egyptian, I'm also finding that the character's glyph means unbeliever in Egyptian. Okay. Um, then, I, then you maybe have the same. Sometimes you have the same phonetic, like a homonym, um, for that word, a pun, if you will. Uh -huh. And it may also have a similar meaning to not not the same meaning, but describing that individual or some feature of that individual. Does and that that's sense? and that yes, and that's the filth. Yeah, and so and then this one you have <laughs> yes, and the filth actually you can get the hook line form for filthy in Egyptian. Too. Oh my goodness! Yeah, and so what, wait, so you're saying oh that Nephi goodness. when he was writing the plates. And he was writing the Lamanites. He wasn't just saying the people that follow my brother. He was literally saying the filthy non-believers. Yeah, that was yeah. all. That, <laughs> that's all. In, that's all. It's all in one glyph. That that is kind of harsh. Yeah. Oh, that <laughs> but, is such, well, you told that me that was <laughs> the most uh, not boring, but difficult. It took us five minutes to get to that sound bite, but it was so satisfying once we got there. Oh my goodness, it's amazing. And a lot of the names are kind of like that. Some I don't yeah. know that I figured out everything. To be honest with you, I mean, I rendered a translation, but it's like, oh, there's a lot of going on here. That is, and then at the bottom here, like I say, this is um, the uh, in Mesoamerica. At least you have the hook form. You know, we have this hook. Uh, in, Teotu, in mural paintings in Teotihuacan, and um, they basically they don't really have translated Teotihuacan. Uh -huh. but they get some of the meanings based on Aztec meanings, and they can tell from context. Yeah. So it's not it's not like a language that has been totally figured out. But they have some idea of some of the glyphs. Mm -hmm. And so this actual glyph, this hook glyph, um, means excrement, whoa, filth, oh, oh, and sin. Whoa! In in Teotihuacan. So okay. So which glyph means this? This little one down here. If you look on, on which slide? Forty on forty. 
on slide 40. Okay. Go up one. I'm putting it on the screen right yeah, now. Yeah, so the one down there it. at the bottom. This little hook the, the, down, these means little... excrement, filth, or sin. And it kind of has the shape. And that shows up. <laughs> oh, that's fun. Because often the glyphs match what oh, they're trying to yeah. describe. <laughs> Wow. So that looks like somebody took a, you know what? So, <laughs> so, so, yeah. So Mor- Mormon, he has all this record, and he could have, he could have made it nice. Well, I'm just telling you, I, I don't see the Reformed Egyptian was not made by Mormon. It was a language that developed over a long period of time, right? And so, he was writing in it, but I'm not saying he was calling them that. That's just what the language was that he had to use. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, and yeah. I, de- I definitely see the connection. There's some you- serious generational trauma there. <laughs> you can tell these tribes hated each other. He's yeah. like, yo, and then the POSs that don't believe in God came over the mountains. Well, and that's kind of why. <laughs> that's kind of why I said if you're Lamanite and you read, if you happen to, you're probably not reading Reformed Egyptian. Yeah. Number one, you probably can't. But if you were so inclined, you probably wouldn't be thrilled to know that you are the crap, filthy sin tribe. Right? Yeah, and and so <laughs> and so there, yeah, there was as animosity that is culturally there, and a lot of people want to like look at the Book of Mormon as some like Pollyanna text, you know, of all this righteousness. It's like no, this is an ancient text talking about ancient people. Their languages reflected some of this animosity. Now the message of the Book of Mormon is to get over that by Mormon and and Moroni yeah. right? and yeah. others is saying, hey, you know, you've got the stripling warriors, you've got all these other people, they're Lamanites, more righteous than you. But for anyone to expect that there wasn't, and I wouldn't say racism because they didn't have different races, really, but ethnocentrism, right. you know, or hostility. You've been fighting these people for hundreds of years. Tribalism. Right, yeah. exactly. So that's actually proof that it's an ancient text, yeah. not not a criticism yeah. of the text, right? So, so when I find something like this, again, I don't find this to this degree <laughs> in every glyph form. So like, yeah, there, exactly. But, but it is it tells you, number one, I think that's what shows the translation is probably correct because it's reflecting things that you might respect expect in this type of a text, right? Right. And so, anyway, so that's one example of one of the glyphs translated. All of them. I show you the exact meaning. One of the criticisms, like, how can you translate this? And I, I preface my book. Number one, I put, no, I did not have a sandy-haired, sandy-haired angel appearing to me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> if I was to form my own church, only three people would join. So that's not a motivation. <laughs> okay, cool. Rock on. <laughs> so I don't care about that. It, but I show you, it's all academic. So everything I give you is out of the same resources that are used to translate right. Egyptian texts. So there's nothing really here. Now, the, the the Maya structure of the dates, that's something unique. And the fact that they're abbreviated, often using the smaller, the more abbreviated, the, it wouldn't necessarily be what you'd find in a total Egyptian text as they've taken the compacted words and shorthanded them mm-hmm. yeah. together. But it's all, you can verify all this yourself if you want. Most of the resources are available online. So, Are there any other plates, archaeological findings, any other ancient structures that have something equivalent to this kind of reformed Egyptian that has shown up on them? Or do you think that it's literally a lost language of a lost people? Well, the reality is there's 17 different scripts that have been discovered in Mesoamerica. Some, many, only one example. So we we know there's scripts out there that were probably When you say heavily, scripts, you mean written languages. Yes. Mm-hmm. And some, like the Epa Olmec, we have like four. They haven't figured it out because they didn't have enough, you know, um, examples of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, And probably the only reason I was able to translate this is because actually it has Egyptian, right? And then I have the Book of Mormon, so I have a trans, I have no generally what I'm looking Mm -hmm. for. And so, um, but yeah, so it has not been found. Although I do this cylinder seal that was in Chiapa di Corzo, I actually translated it kind of looking at it heretic, it's stylized. It basically just means like an offering to a particular king, which is a votive, which is actually what they did with those things. Mm-hmm. And so I rendered that and as a translation, and who knows if people, they probably just, you know, throw it in the garbage or something like that. But but the reality is there are some examples, maybe, of of that may be one example. That has been found. And I, like I say, they're, sometimes that's all they've found of other other scripts. So. All right. Well, we do. We got to start digging now. I'm okay. Again, 
Every time you come to this studio, my mind is blown. I can't believe what I'm hearing, but I'm loving every ounce of it. Guys, if you want to read this, this is for free. This whole entire thing is for free online. If you check out your website, what is it again, Jerry? www. It's Book of Mormon Research and, uh, and Linguistic. Uh, so it's BMSLR. Science and Linguistic Research, BMSLR. BMLS, uh, BMSLR.com. Yeah. Um, you can check it out. You can download it for free there. Um, as dot always. Or, dot org. So. Oh, dot org. Sorry. You can download it for free there. Um, as always, this has been real and this has been fun. For more, please check us out at wordradio.com. How about the car I'm in the driver's seat? I pick you up, but there's only room for me. The only lane that I see is money green, but I pass you. Don't even try to come be nobody else that could do it. Make sure to sleep up after I leave You can try and keep up, but you lose sleep I'm the mystic in the gasoline Can you